Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Bowman, and I'd like to welcome all of you and our C-SPAN audience to this special AI seminar on Abraham Lincoln designed to, co co to coincide with the release of Steven Spielberg's new movie, Lincoln. I've always felt that one of the great privileges and pleasures of being at AI was to be able to take part in these occasional tutorials given by AI scholars. We're very fortunate today to have two of AI's most revered scholars to discuss our 16th president. Walter Burns is a university professor emeritus at Georgetown and an emeritus scholar at AI, where for many years he focused on deepening our understanding of the U.S. Constitution. His Bradley lecture, Lincoln at 200, Why We Still Read Our 16th President, was perhaps the most popular lecture in the scores of Bradley lectures that we've held here over the past quarter century. Dr. Leon Cass holds the Madden Jewett Chair at AI. He's a longtime teacher at the University of Chicago and chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics from 2001 to 2005. This year, Dr. Cass received AI's highest award, the Irving Crystal Lecture, and he delivered a marvelous lecture at our annual dinner, The Other War on Poverty, Finding Meaning in America, which is available on AEI's website, www.aei.org. His most recent book is What So Proudly We Hail, The American Soul in Story, Speech, and Song, written with Amy Cass and Diana Shaw. There is now a website associated with the book, so www.whatsoproudlywehail.org. The authors provide rich resources for teachers and students eager to learn more about what it means to be an American. If I could ask before we begin for all of you to turn off your cell phones, um, just as they do in the movies, we will begin our seminar on Lincoln. Thank you, Carlin. Uh, I should say at the beginning, this is not the first time that Professor Cass and I have talked about Lincoln at AEI. It's also, or it's obviously the first time we've talked about a film since the film is new. I want to say a word about the film. The film is titled Lincoln not Lincoln and Fort Sumter, not Lincoln and the Dred Scott decision, not Lincoln and the territorial question, not Lincoln and the small, the small town lawyer, but simply Lincoln. There's something I think significant in that fact. I think Spielberg intended to prevent, uh, to present the essential Lincoln, perhaps in a film show the greatness of Lincoln. I saw the film with some trepidations. It turned out to be a better film than I thought it would be. I thought Daniel Day-Lewis was excellent as Lincoln. I don't know how the film did it. I don't think he's six foot five inches tall, but somehow the film managed to show that he towered over everybody else in it. I also think that the man who played his chief antagonist in the film, what was his name? Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones playing Daniel. Th Thaddeus uh, Stevenson. Uh, uh, Al Gore's roommate at Harvard, as a matter of fact. He was very good, too. And the film presented the dramatic well, the, the drama in the film is provided by, of course, the passage of the bill in the House of Representatives providing for the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in the United States. As I say, the film was better than I thought it would be. My only particular quarrel with it is the failure of the film to discuss clearly the significance of the various Confederate efforts to uh, come to a peace conference or the various references to the Confederate deputies who wanted to talk about peace, the film somehow doesn't indicate the significance of those events, but so much for that. The question is, did the film present the greatness of Lincoln? I think it did not do that. I would not quarrel with Spielberg for failing to do that, because my point is no film, no play could show the greatness of Lincoln. To make that point, I want to change the subject for a moment. When I was a young teenager in and around Chicago, 
in and around Chicago tennis courts. I spent my youth on tennis courts in and around Chicago. We used to argue frequently, as a matter of fact, as to who was the most beautiful woman in America. <laughs> The women that we would place on this particular pantheon were all movie actresses. I cannot remember the name of a single movie actress from the 1930s, but take my word for it, they were, well, the counterparts of the early, the next generations, Marilyn Monroe or Sophia Loren. I don't remember how we argued that point. I do remember we never settled the argument. A few years and a world war later, I returned to Chicago, this time to the University of Chicago as a graduate student. At Chicago, we read books, great books. One great book I read there was a book called The Loakoan, written by a German 18th century German playwright and classical scholar Gotthold Lessing. The book is about, well, in the first place, Lachun was a man, it was a, was a Trojan priest who warned the Trojans about the tr so called Trojan horse. And for this, he was uh, punished by the Greek god, of whose name I forget here. And he and his two sons were strangled by s monstrous sea serpents. The cover of the book shows that going on. Someone, and the name, name of the sculpture I don't remember, but someone made a sculpture of the event. This has to do with the, the Trojan War and more particularly with Helen. That is to say, what I want to say about it has to do with Helen, a woman of surpassing beauty the wife of Menelaus, the Spartan king, who was seduced by Paris and taken to Troy. The consequence of that seduction and kidnapping, of course, was the Trojan War. Sometime in the, uh, 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 yeah. this book, this essay, the Laokuan, has to do really with well, it's an essay on the role of the arts. On the one hand, the plastic arts, sculpture and painting, and on the other hand, poetry. What they can do and their limitations. And specifically, how does this poet, perhaps the greatest poet of all time, Homer, describe Helen, the greatest, the most beautiful woman in the world? The fact of the matter is, he doesn't do it. He portrays the scene in the so-called House of Nobles, which was a kind of Trojan House of Lords, in which these old codgers, something like me, are sitting around, and Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, comes into the room. He makes no effort to describe her beauty. He makes a passing reference to her white arms and beautiful hands but he could be describing Bella Absok or somebody. <laughs> because lots of women have white arms and beautiful hands. How does he describe Helen? He doesn't. He describes her effect. She comes into this room of old men and one of them says to the others, she was worth the war. I conclude from that that it's not possible or to put it this way, the beauty of a human being, the, beautiful, the beauty of a woman does not lend itself to verbal description. My point, of course, is not that. My point is really that the greatness of Lincoln does not lend itself to dramatic depiction, meaning nobody, not Steven Spielberg or any other playwright, or filmmaker can use his art and succeed in demonstrating Lincoln's greatness. The fact of the matter is, Lincoln, greatness, his greatness consisted in his words. 
and the use to which he put those words, the political use to which he put those words. I have said, and I will repeat today, Lincoln is America's poet. He's America's poet as Homer was the Greek's poet, as Shakespeare was the Eng English poet. There can be no argument about anything in Shakespeare's case. One thinks of, uh, well, Shakespeare wrote of English kings and English rulers. Uh, the great John and Gaunt speeches, and I think in Richard's, Richard's second, where John and Gaunt speaks of this blessed, I can't, re -spe can't speak, remind, I can't remember the whole speech, but it goes something like this. This throne of kings, this emerald isle, this something or other, this England. Or Henry V, where Henry V, otherwise known as, what's his name, the actor, speaks of, well, what do, what have kings that privates do not have save ceremony, general ceremony. Just as Homer and Shakespeare were poets, so I would argue is Abraham Lincoln America's poet. His speech, his great political speeches are really poems in a sense. The films, one film, Saving Private Ryan, he went so far as to quote a famous Lincoln letter to Mrs. Bixby, Bixby a letter of condolence. It's not the greatest of those letters. It's the greatest of such letters is a letter that Lincoln wrote to Fanny McCullough. Fanny McCullough was a teenage girl the daughter of a, a friend of Lincoln's from Illinois who was killed in battle and Lincoln wrote this letter of condolence to her. At a particular time it's interesting. This was after the Battle of Antietam, shortly after the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest day in American history after which Lincoln had had to, def to fire the commanding general McClellan and appoint a new one named Burnside who was shortly to commit the catastrophe at Fredericksburg. At the same time Lincoln was trying his best to get support for his Emancipation Proclamation which was to be formally issued on the 1st of January. During all this time, during all his problems, he sat down and wrote this letter in his own handwriting. I no longer am able to read, but Professor Cass has agreed to read the letter, and it's something to listen to. <clears throat> Dear Fanny, it is with deep grief that I learn of the death of your kind and brave father, and especially that it is affecting your young heart beyond what is common in such cases. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all. And to the young, it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. The older have learned to ever expect it. I am anxious to afford some alleviation of your present distress. Perfect relief is not possible except with time. You cannot now realize that you will ever feel better. Is this not so? And yet it is a mistake. You are sure to be happy again. To know this, which is certainly true, will make you some less miserable now. I have had experience enough to know what I say, and you need only to believe it to feel better at once. The memory of your dear father, instead of an agony, will yet be a sad, sweet feeling in your heart of a purer and holier sort than you have known before. Please present my kind regards to your afflicted mother, your sincere friend, A. Lincoln. What does one say of a man who, in the midst of all his troubles, and God knows Lincoln had troubles, could sit down in his own hand and write a letter to that, like that to a teenaged girl? Well, as I say, he was America's poet. To illustrate that point, 
I want to quote the last paragraph of the first inaugural. The point was that the union was breaking up. He spent the preceding paragraphs trying to argue with the South not to secede or to argue that they had no right to secede. And he ends by saying this, I am loath to close. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Passion may have strained, but it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. We know certain things about Lincoln. He had no speechwriter. He wrote every word he uttered, every word he published. He wrote, and he wrote this. And it's not by chance that his most celebrated speech, the Gettysburg Address, was delivered on a battlefield on the occasion of dedicating a cemetery filled with the graves of patriots. Professor Cass will now provide an explication of that particular text. Thank you, Walter. Um, I want me say just one word about this, the uh, about the, the film to echo. I think uh, uh, what Walter Burns has said. I mean, we see really, a, in some ways, a compelling portrait of of Lincoln. We see his mastery of political maneuvering. We see his resolution, something of his prudence, his humanity and his suffering, his common touch and his way with words. Um, we see something of his determination to pass the 13th Amendment and his de devotion to a complete victory in the Civil War, um, insisting on complete surrender rather than a negotiated peace. But we don't get anything of a picture of Lincoln's principles or of his profound understanding of the American Republic and its need for a refounding. For that, you really have to listen to Lincoln's words, to his speeches. Uh, these are things he presented at great length, uh, but some in lapidary form and none better than the Gettysburg Address. For those of you who've seen the movie, the Gettysburg Address shows up at the beginning with little touches where young people are quoting back to him phrases from the speech and he's grateful for this, but the, but the movie doesn't treat the speech uh, um, as a speech, or no, nor does it try to get at its meaning. And uh, my task today is to try to say something about what I think is going on in this speech and why it really is, in lapidary form, a really a perfect expression of Lincoln's understanding of America and of his task. The speech, as you know, has been memorized, recited, and admired. All kinds of scholars have discussed its rhetorical devices, its literary merit, its political reception. But very few have attended to the thought of Lincoln's speech and the deeper purposes that it serves. Everybody sees that this funeral oration honoring the Union dead in the battle that marked the turning point in the war against Southern rebellion was even more clearly a summons to the living to prosecute to a victorious conclusion a war that despite the victory at Gettysburg was still not going well enough. The great task remaining before us is first and foremost the winning of the war. But very few people see the speech that the speech offers Lincoln's reinterpretation of the American founding, his understanding of why the war is a test of that founding, and his own redefinition of this nation now being reborn as a result of passing that bloody test. Central to Re Lincoln's declaration of America reborn is his own new, as it were, baptismal teaching on the relation between liberty and equality, crucial to our new birth of freedom. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to offer evidence for these very large claims. Now, the express rhetorical purpose of the speech is evident on the surface. 
The occasion is, as Walter has said, a dedication of the Union Cemetery at Gettysburg for the burial of the nearly 5,300 Union fallen, killed in two days. Another 17,000 Union soldiers are wounded, 27,000 Confederate soldiers killed or wounded two days. Lincoln acknowledges that it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. By the way, you have your te the texts are at your seat if you'd like to, to, to look on. But Lincoln is much less interested in dedicating a patch of earth to honor the dead than he is in inspiring his listeners, us the living, who are, despite dispiriting loss and grief, quote, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced, to the great task remaining before us, namely victory in the war and the restoration of the Union now on a more solid foundation. But it is the outer frame of the speech, and especially its beginning and its end, that bespeaks Lincoln's larger purpose, to create for future generations an interpretation of the war, and especially the war's relation to both the once new nation brought forth by our fathers and conceived in liberty, and this nation, which through the sacrifice of war and our dedication, shall have a new birth of freedom. Before turning to those passages at the beginning and the end, I need to say something about the relation of this speech to a concern that had preoccupied Lincoln for at least 25 years. In January 1838, in a remarkable speech to the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln, aged 28, worried about the perpetuation of our institutions, now that the founding generation had gone to rest and those who had known them were also dying out. It's an astonishing speech, informed by profound reflections on themes such as law and lawlessness, soaring political ambition, including his own, and the vulnerability of free institutions in democratic times to both mob rule and tyranny. It is in this speech that Lincoln asserts the per that perpetuating our political institutions requires what he called the development of a political religion comprising reverence for the laws and more generally sober sentiments, quote, hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason, among them our founding principles. As Lincoln put it, quote, passion has helped us but can do so no more. It will in the future be our enemy. Reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. Let those materials be molded into general intelligence, sound morality, and in particular, a reverence for the Constitution and laws. Now, it's my contention that Lincoln was, throughout his life, obsessed with the problem of attaching his fellow citizens to the American Republic, and that he self-consciously crafted his best political utterances with a view to their becoming canonical texts of the much needed American political religion. Now the Gettysburg Address is obviously in both form and substance a perfect text for the Bible of American political religion. It's short enough to be memorized. Three paragraphs of progressively increasing length, a mere 10 sentences, 272 words, only 130 different words, 74% of which are monosyllables. The polysyllabic words stand out against the little words, and only a few pregnant longer words appear more than once. Among the disyllabic words, only conceived, living, rather, people three times in the last clause, and especially nation five times. New nation, paragraph one, that nation, any nation, that nation, paragraph two, but this nation in the last sentence of paragraph three this nation that shall re be reborn into freedom. Among still longer words, Lincoln uses more than once only devotion twice, consecrate or consecrated twice, and the most important word in the speech, dedicate or dedicated, six times. Noteworthy also is the echoing use of the word here, heard eight times, the importance of which will be clear by the end. 
The three paragraphs of progressively increasing length refer to time periods and actors of progressively, progressively increasing rhetorical importance. Paragraph one, the past, four score and seven years ago, our fathers, 30 words. Paragraph two, the very immediate present, now, we who are engaged in a great civil war and a much smaller we who are right here and right now met on a great battlefield of that war and who fittingly and properly have come to dedicate a portion of that field, 73 words. And paragraph three, our future in relation to our present and our past, contrasting the brave men who fought and died with us the living and moving from our inability through speech to dedicate to dedicate ground better consecrated, consecrated by the deeds of brave men, to us the living dedicating ourselves to the great task remaining before us, to we here highly resolving to win the war so that certain great things will follow, both for this nation, a new birth, and also for people everywhere. 169 words, nearly half of them in the last sentence about our dedication. The speech in its spatial references has an hourglass structure, widest below. It opens on this continent, narrows in its center to a great battlefield, and even narrower a portion of that field, but finishes by suggesting that our dedication here can ensure that popular government will never perish from the whole earth, the last word of the speech. But these are smaller formal details important for rhetorical effect, but hardly by themselves enough to give the speech its canonical standing. For that, we get to look at its content, and especially the beginning and the end. Let's examine them. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Four score and seven years ago, why does Lincoln begin with this expression? Scholars note that the language is biblical and it echoes the 90th Psalm. The days of our years are three score and 10, or even by reason of strength, four score years. But few notice that by this biblical reference, Lincoln is making a crucial substantive point. The deed he is about to recount, he intimates, happened not in living memory. Four score and seven years ago, no one alive today in 1863 had yet been born. Lincoln's beginning reflects and highlights his long-standing concern about perpetuation in a fully post-revolutionary age. The theme and imagery of the first paragraph and indeed of the frame of the speech as a whole is birth. The birth and at the end, the rebirth of the nation. Four score and seven or 87 years identifies that birth year as 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence, not 1787, the year of the Constitution. Lincoln gives no hint of the bloody war of American separation and secession that secured indeed the Declaration's verbal assertion of our independence from Great Britain. Instead, Lincoln gives us an image of quiet generative concourse and natural birth. According to Lincoln, our fathers, and by the way, after pointing out that we couldn't have known them, they should, they should really are rightly our grandfathers, using biblical language referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he calls them our fathers, bringing us closer to them in spirit and inviting pious reverence for our patrimony. But in any case, our fathers brought forth or sired upon this continent as mother, a new nation. It's not new only, it's new not only in historical fact, it is new also in principle. Lincoln tells us here precisely how it was distinctly novel. It was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Several points deserve emphasis, and especially when we compare Lincoln's description of the founding birth with the birth certificate language of the Declaration of Independence itself. 
as you all know, in the Declaration, the signers declare, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In Lincoln's version, three important changes are made. First, Lincoln changes a self-evident truth to a proposition. Both ideas come from geometry, and Lincoln had studied Euclid. But by the way, that bit in the movie about uh, Euclid being the basis for Lincoln's belief in, 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 in uh, inequality was just hokum. Uh, but never mind. Um, a self-evident truth is, in geometry, an axiom which neither admits of proof nor requires it, for it contains its evidence in itself. The whole is greater than the part. If you know what a whole is and you know what a part is, the statement the whole is greater than the part is simply obvious. According to the Declaration of Independence, human equality is held to be an axiom, evident in itself. If one understands the meaning of men, one must immediately see that all men are equally human. A proposition, on the other hand, is like a geometrical theorem. Its truth must be proved, yet it may turn out to be unprovable or even false. According to Lincoln, human equality was less a self-evident premise of the American founding, more a proposition in need of future demonstration. That's a very big change. The significance of this shift from axiom to proposition is revealed by Lincoln's second big change. According to Lincoln, our fathers treated all men are created equal, not as the Declaration states, as a truth that we hold, but as something to which they were dedicated. Lincoln shifts the picture from theory to practice. The proposition is more than an intellectual matter one holds as a belief and proves in speech. It is a practical goal to which one must devote oneself in action. The truth of the proposition of human equality cannot be shown by Euclidean reasoning. It must be demonstrated through deed and devotion. Third and most subtly, Lincoln does not ask us to think of the proposition only as a universal truth that we too can try to prove in practice. He wraps that truth in the pious drapery of the dedication of our fathers. We should take an interest in this proposition, he implies, not only because it might be true, but as a matter of honoring the memory of our remarkable fathers. In short, Lincoln has transformed a merely intellectual truth held as self-evident and accessible to universal human reason, that was the Declaration's formulation, into a truth requiring practical demonstration by a particular people, beginning with our revered fathers, who dedicate themselves to doing exactly this. In this way, Lincoln summons our ancestral piety and attaches it to an emerging political religion whose creed Lincoln is here redefining. Yet as we shall see, ancestral piety cannot alone sustain us and a new birth is necessary, in large part because our fathers did not get it exactly right. Why does Lincoln change the Declaration? In order to address and correct a deep difficulty in our founding regarding the relation between equality and liberty. A clue is provided in the other big idea in the first sentence, conceived in liberty. We know the fathers, we know the mother continent, and we know the child nation and what to what it is dedicated. But what's meant by conceived in liberty? And how does this idea figure in Lincoln's revision of the story of America's birth? I have to confess that the oddity of the word in in this phrase, conceived in liberty, confused me for many, for many years. One astute reader has suggested that just as a natural child is conceived in love, so the American national child was conceived in love of liberty. I myself toyed with conceived freely or conceived by choice rather than by necessity or nature or in passion, or alternatively, alternatively conceived in an act of independence and liberation 
from the rule of Britain. But an illuminating interpretation was given to me by a friend, Harvey Flamenhoft, of St. John's College in Annapolis. In Liberty, he suggested to me, uh, refers, he suggests, refers to the political matrix that characterizes both the before and the after of the bringing forth of the new nation. And that matrix is, in fact, British liberty, the context which was also the context of the American colonies. Britain, like the new republic, was a liberal polity. But Britain, unlike the new republic, in Britain, unlike the new republic, liberty was mixed with a hereditary principle. Not only the monarchy, but especially a hereditary nobility of dukes and barons who lorded it over the commons. The truly American innovation is the replacement of the hereditary principle with the principle of equality and equal rights. Governments, the founders declared, exist to secure the rights not only of the highborn of hereditary principles, but of all men who are equally endowed with unalienable rights. We today take for granted the compatibility of political liberty and political equality. But this novel addition of the principle of equality to the principle of liberty was then an unprecedented experiment. Not unreasonably, it gave rise to two big questions. Can a nation so conceived and so dedicated long endure? And can political equality be obtained without the surrender of liberty? Those were live questions. One of them Lincoln raises himself in the beginning of the speech. Let's take the second question first. Lincoln had been personally attacked as a tyrant who was destroying liberty because he pursued equality too zealously. Maryland, My Maryland, the state song written in 1861 begins, the despot's heel is on thy shore, his torch is at thy temple door, Maryland and the alleged despot, none other than Abraham Lincoln. His later suspension of the writ of habeas corpus would eventually be ruled unconstitutional. Yet Lincoln teaches in this speech that commitment to equality is not only compatible with liberty, but is in fact freedom's only true foundation. Regarding the first point, Lincoln says the war is a test a test of the durability of a nation committed to equality as well as to liberty. And although he does not say so here, as he does in the second inaugural, the war is a test that is now upon the nation because of an offensive defect in the founding. The defect is not mentioned by name in the Gettysburg Address, but its name is slavery. And by the way, Lincoln does not mention either the North or the South or even the Union in this speech nor does he assign blame for the war. In the second inaugural, he explicitly suggests that the offense of slavery lies with the nation as a whole. The Declaration of Independence was a liberal document, not a Republican one. It did not by itself specify any particular form of government. Any government is legitimate so long as it secures the rights of all who live under its rule. Yet despite adding the egalitarian principle to the British liberal principle, and despite the fact that in Lincoln's reformulation of the nation's birth, equality as the goal was to come out of liberty by way of dedication, the new nation was flawed and stained from the start by the institution of slavery. Contrary to current opinion, many of the founders understood that America's practice fell short of its founding principles and they devised instrumentalities that they hoped would place save slavery in the course of its ultimate extinction. But by Lincoln's time, the situation had deteriorated. Not only was the regime in contradiction with itself falling short of its stated ideals. Worse, the South in rebelling had given effect to the view that the principle of equality was not merely too lofty, but in fact, as a proposition, simply false. Lincoln knew that this denial of human equality was the true cause of the war, and Lincoln understood that the bloody str struggle over slavery was the true test of the nation. That, by the way, is the reason he insists upon the surrender. Now that the self-evident truth of equality had been turned into a proposition needing truth, 
And now that the rebels had repudiated the proposition, calling it a self-evident lie, passing the test meant winning the war because many, winning the war meant a repudiation of that repudiation, an indispensable vindication of the proposition of human equality, which is central to Lincoln's understanding of the American founding. So what really was at issue in this war, and why was, must we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain? The goal for which victory is indispensable is twofold, both transcending the mere restoration of the now dissolved Union, and this is at the end of the speech. First, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and second, that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The new birth of freedom for which Lincoln is offering here the baptismal blessing and explanation is a birth through blood, not through generative concourse of ancestral patriarchs and mother continent. More important, this new freedom will differ from British liberty in which the nation was first conceived. Here, equality will not come out of liberty. Rather, freedom will be born out of equality because the inegalitarian principle and the practice of slavery will be repudiated and defeated as the necessary condition of the rebirth of freedom. Masters as well as slaves will share in this new birth of freedom, having shed the mutual degradation that enslavement brings to them both. Liberty, says Lincoln, not only has not been destroyed, as the rebels claimed, it will for the first time be put on a truly secure foundation. The radical equality of all human beings, now thrice called the people, who will govern and be governed for their own well-being. We the people, we the living rededicating ourselves here on the graves of the fallen, become under God the nation's new patriarchs and founders. It's a democratic refounding here and now. Just to close, the nation conceived in liberty got a new birth of freedom thanks to the self-sacrificing deeds of our brave men who struggled here and elsewhere, and thanks to the dedication of the living under Lincoln's leadership to the cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. But taking the long view, the nation better became able to attach the hearts and minds of its citizens thanks to the words fitly spoken at Gettysburg by Father Abraham, who presided over its refounding in speech no less than in deed, and whose words have inspired all who came afterwards to dedicate themselves to preserve, protect, and perfect our political freedom and equality. Today and tomorrow, our attachment to the Republic is greatly enhanced whenever we reanimate Lincoln's words and under their still living instruction remain dedicated to his vision of our natural meaning and purpose. Walter, you want to continue? Yeah. Um, I think one can gather from what Professor Cass has said about the Gettysburg Address that we're dealing, when we're dealing with Lincoln, with an extraordinary man. I don't hesitate to say that Lincoln was a genius. I remember in this connection something said by the German, great German poet Goethe, that when you're dealing with genius, all you can do is admire it. Uh, we people in Chicago know all about Goethe. We named a street after him. It's called Gothi Street. I would like to conclude our presentation today, and incidentally, we hope we have provoked some discussion, concluded by referring to the last paragraph of the second inaugural. In the piece I wrote on Lincoln, that when I gather you have copies of it, after my conclusion of the declaration, I go into the uh, last paragraph of the second inaugural and refer to it as its the, the awesome beauty of it. With malice towards none, with charity for all, 
with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who sh shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which shall achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Six weeks later, he was murdered. We sometimes say that a man can be known by the company he keeps. And I would say and repeat here that a nation can be known by the men it admires most of all, by its heroes. And I think this country, the United States of America, pays itself the greatest compliment when it says Abraham Lincoln is that man for us. I don't think, in fact I know, that Steven Spielberg did not manage somehow to convey the greatness of Lincoln in that film. I do think, however, that he had some knowledge of the man he was dealing with was a great man. And for that I think we should praise him for the film. So, discussion. Please. Uh, you Why don't you stand so people can hear you? You compared uh, Lincoln earlier to Shakespeare and uh, to Homer, and you referred just recently to his genius. Could you explain why he pursued a life of politics and not something more contemplative? How, how he did what? Why he pursued a life of politics uh -huh. rather than something more contemplative. Uh -huh. Well, I suppose the first answer to that is it was the only role open to him. And in the second place, I would say that politics provides the best opportunity for someone like him to portray his talents in some particular way. It's not by chance, I think, that the great, the great drama deals with great people. I may insult some of you by giving an American example of the opposite. I don't know whether you, the play is still known but a few years ago, there was a, a play done by an American playwright, Arthur Miller, called The Death of a Salesman. I never saw the play, but I had it described to me. And my reaction to it was, who in the devil cares when that salesman dies? But one cares whether kings die. And it's not by chance that great poets deal with the death of kings because great events take place and these kings and Lincoln in his position as president of the United States at that particular time was faced with the question of doing great things. So you write, we write and talk about Lincoln because he was involved in great things. We write and talk about Henry V because he too was involved in great things. Why pursue a, a career in politics? Because it provides the opportunity to do really great things, more than a professor. Please. Um, there's been a lot written uh, since the movie about its modern implications and what people should take away from it. And I think Congress easy, had a showing of it. Uh, Congress had a showing of it and the presidents had a showing of it. And so I was just wondering, uh, what do you think people should take away from seeing the movie besides Lincoln's greatness? Are there modern applications? I don't mean the Republicans should do this and the Democrats should do that, but, but what, when we leave the theater, what should we be feeling That's in addition to that. Lincoln's greatness? Well. Um, Look, I think one of the salutary um, 
One of the salutary features of the film is that it shows, especially to young people who are filled with all kinds of idealism, um, that it takes more than having good ideas uh, to get those, uh, to, to make those ideas efficacious. Um, one has to engage in the difficult work of persuading and cajoling and twisting arms and much is made of the fact in the movie, I think too much is made of the fact, well, not, not, not too much, much is made of the fact of, 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 of Lincoln as masterful tactician, <coughs> strategist, and politician, and a man who knows how to twist arms to get things done. That's an important lesson for people who, uh, who think, uh, who, who have no idea about how difficult it is to accomplish anything. Um, I thought the movie was short, however, on showing the connection between all of that operation and um, the deeply held understanding and the high principle that guided Lincoln's life. We don't really know why it was that Lincoln was so insistent upon the complete surrender of the South rather than uh, uh, some kind of peaceful settlement and why the 13th Amendment was uh, so dear to him. Um, I mean, the abolitionists were the people who were said to be the people animated by hatred of slavery, and Lincoln was merely, according to lots of things that you'll hear, merely interested in union. Um, but if you understand Lincoln's understanding of union and its flawed founding, then you see that he understands both the war, he sees the war as a necessary refounding, and that it is to vindicate the principle of equality um, and to put the country on its proper foundation, that he accepts the war, fights it to the finish, pushes for this amendment. That's not sufficiently clear. Whether there is anybody today um, in public life who has a large vision of principle that informs um, the maneuvering that we see, um, we would like to see it and hear about it. Um, if somebody comes away from this movie saying, okay, it's time to play hardball now, I saw how Lincoln did it, um, they're, they're imitating the means and not the end. And I think what Walter and I have tried to do is to lay out a picture, uh, something more of the man and what he was about, and not just, I mean, I think it's in here. I think if, if you knew more about Lincoln, you could see it in the film but it wasn't highlighted. And for most people who've reviewed it, the talk is about you know, Lincoln politician, Lincoln opportunist. Um, uh, Lincoln uses immoral means. In fact, um, it's said in the movie, right, that the purest man, um, uh, uh, he has Stevens say um, that, that these, the, this was done uh, by uh, improper means by the purest man of all, as if that was somehow strange. What do you want to add? Yeah. Um, with respect to your first question about what other profession, Lincoln was a lawyer. In fact, he went back into politics at a particular point, and that particular point had to do with slavery and the, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. That got him back in politics. That was the only thing he could do, really. The other thing that uh, Professor Cass just mentioned and I mentioned in my prepared remarks to the extent that they were prepared about uh, the failure of the film to do a particular thing, and that had to do with the peace things. It's not clear in the film what Lincoln's position with respect to peace was. In 1864, beginning in early May, on May 3rd, I, as I recall, that happened to be my birthday, Grant's army fought what we call the Battle of the Wilderness. A couple of weeks later, they fought at Spotsylvania. A couple of weeks after that, in early June, at Cold Harbor. His casualties at that particular time, this is spring 1864, his casualties were over 60,000 Union troops. <coughs> Think of that appalling number. The clamor for peace was tremendous. The newspapers, of course, led by Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, were insistent that Lincoln to enter into negotiations with the Confederates for peace at any price. 
the Democratic Party in its convention nominated General McClellan as its presidential candidate. And in its platform, it insisted that the South be allowed to remain a slavery state, states. The film does not make this clear. It speaks of the, the peace negotiations at City Point in January 65, when the Confederate delegation was led by the Vice Presidency of the Confederate, Alexander, this is interesting, Stevens from Georgia, his, named by his parents, Alexander Hamilton Stevens, comes for peace. And the Confederates wanted a peace arrangement to be, to be between the Confederate States of America and the United States of America, just as we had peace between Japan and the United States after World War II. The Confederate States would remain the Confederate States. Lincoln absolutely refused to negotiate with anything calling itself the Confederate States because the Union was the Union. To acknowledge the Confederacy was to, to, to acknowledge the existence of what Lincoln refused to acknowledge. That was clear. And he also insisted against the wishes of people like Horace Greeley, the editor, that the so-called Confederate states had to abolish slavery, had to acknowledge that. So that at City Point in these negotiations, Lincoln, Lincoln finally agreed to go there, and he went there. And he talked with Stevens. They had been Whig congressmen together back in the 1840s. They knew each other and liked each other. And Stevens said at one point, as I understand it, you regard us as traitors who are liable to be hanged for treason. And Lincoln said that was so. And then Stevens paid a great compliment to Lincoln. He said, I suppose that would be your position, but frankly, so long as you are president, we don't any of us think we're going to be hanged. Another. Back. Thank you for that, and I guess I should thank Steven Spielberg for the movie, I'm told. Um, I have a kind of negative reaction to it, which I want to describe. But should I come up closer? We can, if you speak louder, we can hear you. I'll try louder. Um, let me come up closer. And then microphone. <clears throat> I'm told by friends that I should be glad that someone finally made a movie about Lincoln and a movie that portrays him as a real hero. But frankly, part of my reaction was, why did Spielberg pick this one month when the war was essentially won and not, for example, portray all the challenges that Lincoln faced in being elected as someone who opposed the expansion of slavery, or even more important, why didn't he show Lincoln as a war president? And is this just an accident? Or it seems to me that it diminishes Lincoln to say that, yes, of course he paid for votes just like Obama did for Obamacare. That is not what made him a hero. And I believe in that summer that you describe, when he was facing imminent defeat in the election at the hands of McClellan, he nonetheless rejected a Confederate peace delegation, I think, that came to Canada. Uh, and the truth is, which the movie didn't show, if Sherman hadn't destroyed Atlanta, McClellan might have been president and the war would have ended yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. No, thanks, Paul. That's a, well, there's no, no reason for me to repeat any, any part of that because what you say is actually essential. And uh, in, in the, the paper that you have, I tried to, to indicate that, talking about uh, the situation in the spring of 1864. Lincoln actually wrote a little note in a sealed envelope and gave it to the members of his cabinet in which he 
predicted that he would lose that election unless something miraculous happened. Well, that miraculous was Sherman's march through Georgia and the capture of Atlanta, and that changed the, uh, changed the character of the war. Um, it was a narrow squeak. Instead, I should say this, sometime after the publication of this, uh, after the delivery of this Bradley lecture, I woke up and my wife showed me a full page of the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal, which had reprinted part of that speech, and it had reprinted it thanks to Paul Wolfowitz, who called the editor and insisted they print it. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I got $400 for that. <laughs> um, no, I agree with uh, both of your assessments that it's not a great movie, but I wonder if it can be considered a, a good movie, a very good movie. And the reason why I say that is that, that at least when I saw the movie in the theater, um, two things happened that were striking. First, after uh, the House passes the resolution, uh, there was applause uh, and by the audience. And then at the very end of the movie, there was applause. And I took away from that that people actually did get the core message, which is that yeah, Lincoln had, do, had did all these practical things to get the measure passed, but there was a limit. He, you know, he, he won't bribe somebody. I mean, he'll use, you know, whatever means he can, but there, he won't go beyond that. Uh, and the second thing is, it, again, it's not perfectly clear about uh, the negotiations with the South uh, versus why the, the why the amendment has to be go first. But I think people pretty quickly understood that. He was trying to end slavery, you know, on a matter of equality, uh, and not have a negotiated settlement where that would be left uh, unsure. So, again, I don't think it's a great movie. Uh, I think there's a lot, obviously, as Walter suggested, you can't possibly accomplish in a movie about uh, a genius like Lincoln. But I think on, on the core question, I think the audience came away uh, understanding uh, this essential point about Lincoln, and, and hence, um, when they walk out of the theater, um, you know, in this day and age, they got it. Yeah, no, I, I, I uh, thank you very much, uh, Gary, for that. I, I, I agree with that. And um, uh, it, it's true that we don't see a lot of Lincoln as a war president um, and the difficulties of some of those decisions in the darker days of, of the war. Um, um, but um, the advantage of focusing on the struggle to pass the 13th Amendment makes it possible, at least tacitly, to show that the concern for ending slavery was in fact central to Lincoln's purpose. Um, and that saving the Union and abolishing slavery were two faces of the same thing. Um, and I think that, um, that, was, that was, was, was certainly salutary even if you don't have, even if the places where he discusses how he comes to equality were really sort of hokey and there were certain sort of hallmark sentimentality in various places uh, where, where there was an attempt to discuss principle. But still, I think the overall thrust of this is, is to enable us to see that he rather than, rather that he as much as the abolitionists hated slavery and that he alone amongst them knew how to do it. And that's, um, that's, that's no yeah. small part of, of, of what one uh, honors here, in addition to his, to his remarkable understanding and words that he has left us to, to, to teach us. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the abolitionists uh, may have hated slavery, but they cared nothing for the Constitution and said that and did not support Lincoln. It's an astonishing fact that the abolitionists did not support him for re-election in 1864. But the fact of the matter is that there could have been no abolition of slavery without the Union. The Union had to exist. First came the salvation of the Union because that was the precondition for the abolition of slavery. If the Union didn't exist, Consider the radical case. 
all these southern states would go off with over 90% of the blacks in America as slaves. And any attempt to abolish slavery in that foreign country would require a war. Lincoln understood that. I'll repeat, the salvation of the Union was the condition for the abolition of slavery. No Union, no abolition. Yeah, but, but also you want to say quickly, um, no abolition of slavery, no properly founded Union. Yeah. Which is why I think, in, in some way, the movie manages to hold these two things together in Lincoln's own purpose, in her own person. And to that extent, I think, uh, I think yeah. it's, it, it, it is successful. I think the audience does get it. And um, there's none of the revisionist stuff about, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, Lincoln's a depressive, uh, Lincoln's um, closet gay, he's got Marfan syndrome, all of this, this stuff which is now fashionable. There was a really respectful and high-minded treatment of him, I thought. Um, I, there's one point about the, the film that uh, um, I thought faulty, another part of the film I thought faulty. It, it didn't end at the proper time. There's one scene where Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln are in the, in the carriage going off to the theater at some point like that, the film should have ended because everybody knew after that comes the assassination at Ford Theater. You did not have to have another scene, in which I didn't know they had a scene of some play going on at the same time in some other theater. Where, where the sun is, where Tad is watching. Yeah, yeah, that was unnecessary. And dramatically, that's a failure. Yeah. Please. Um. So I thought it was telling that the film spent a, a fair amount of time sort of detailing his, you know, his personal life, right, as well as his, his political life. And I, I think to some extent um, that was sort of just a, a ploy to get people, you know, to watch and be interested. They'll, like, dramatize the wife and the kids, et cetera. But um, I, you come away with the impression that for him, um, his, his politics, I guess, was the most personal thing to him because he put it above all else. Uh, you frequently see him just like kind of not talking to his wife when she needs him or ignoring the kids when they need him or just kind of like that was very much his, his most personal priority. And I wanted to know, I guess, to what extent, you know, you, you felt that was an accurate portrayal and um, do you think, were you happy with, with sort of the balance, the way the movie, the movie portrayed the two? I don't know, you want to respond to that? Um, was the question audible? Yeah. Um, look, it's always dangerous, in my view, when you show the life of public figures and in order to get people interested, you take them into the bedroom and, 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 and show aspects of their private life. On the other hand, um, I mean, there were a few places where I thought um, it was uh, either unnecessary or improper. Um, but well, I guess, I, I mean, I thought that was interesting that, that you had said earlier, it's a very respectful treatment, because that was one thing I didn't like about the film, is that they showed things that I felt, you know, that I wasn't, it wasn't necessary. Well, well, if they wanted to do that, you know, the most t telling thing they might have shown you know, is the death of, Will of Lincoln's son, Willie, during his time in the White House. That was a crushing blow. And, you know, you think of all the problems that Lincoln had to have that. And then, of course, there is the problem of his wife, who was a little batty, you know. And she spent a lot of money <laughs> getting rid of the linoleum in the White House <laughs> and replacing it with a decent floor and so forth and so on. An extraordinary amount of money. So a little bit of that human business, and I think the death of Willie would have been better than uh, and the problems with the son who ended up on Grant's staff and whom he's allegedly slapped. I wonder if that's actually true. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, just one, one small thing. Um, I didn't mind it all that much, um, partly because it's another aspect 
of the extraordinary humanity of this man. And um, that he finds um, ways of offering small comfort, of still being fatherly, of um, dealing with a difficult wife. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's an aspect of the life of the man under those circumstances. A little bit of it goes a long way. Um, and some of those scenes were very, very touching. Um, and especially the scene about the enlistment of Robert. Um, I mean, that's uh, when, uh, when Agamemnon goes to make war uh, to recover Helen uh, for his brother. The gods require that he sacrifice his own daughter so that he understands what it is that he's about to do. And uh, this was uh, Lincoln, who'd already lost one son, uh, about to s saying yes, having to say yes as president to the possible sacrifice of the second, seems to me is an aspect of the personal life, of, of the life of a leader who has, uh, it's not a question of showing balance, but it's showing something of the cost of what it is to be in that place. And I thought it, I thought it did some of those things nicely. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that it's, it's too easy to criticize Spielberg for what he did do and what he didn't do. But one has to recognize that the materials of, of Lincoln's life do not lend themselves readily to a tragedy. Um, take the case, well, perhaps the best tragedy in the English language, Hamlet. That's easy for Shakespeare. Here's a man whose father is killed by his uncle, et cetera, et cetera. He wants vengeance. In a way, he wants to be the tragic hero. Unfortunately, he doesn't live back in the time of Agamemnon and Achilles and Hector and so forth. He lives in the Christian era when you cannot do what Achilles does. And you, you cannot, for example, commit suicide as uh, Hamlet points out in that first of his soliloquies, to be or not to be, to die or not, and so forth and so on. He lives in the Christian era, and he is a Christian, and he cannot take vengeance because, I didn't realize this until recently, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Does anybody here know where that verse appears? It's in the New Testament. It's in Paul's epistle to the Romans, the Romans, who are classical people. Hamlet can't be that, and, it's, and Shakespeare writes a wonderful, tragic play about Hamlet's dilemmas, wanting to be a classical like Achilles, but can't be it because he's, he's a Christian. That, such materials are not available to Spielberg and you fasten on something like the 13th Amendment and hope that this will suffice. In the back. Uh, you say that Lincoln is attempting to harmonize the notion of liberty with the principle of equality. And certainly throughout the war, at many times he sacrifices liberty in short doses for the broader notion of equality, so suspending habeas corpus, right. for instance. But there are also many times in his sort of non-war policy, uh, with respect to railroads or labor policy or harbor policy and those sorts of things, where he seems to be far more egalitarian and communitarian than someone um, sort of obsessed with the notion of liberty might admit. Um, how do you reconcile is, is that? Is this one such speaker? <laughs> how, how does one reconcile that? And what does this mean for sort of modern policy making if we're still attempting to establish this proposition? That's for you. 
Yeah, I think it's for me. And it's a hard, it's, it's a very good and welcome question, both, both parts of it. Um, um, I'm not sufficiently up on the particular violations of what you would call the particular violations of liberty that would suggest that Lincoln is, is not libertarian enough. Um, but on the larger questions, I mean, to live in a, in a country which um, can uh, secure to each individual their uh, God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is, those are the liberal principles of the American founding, um, of free institutions. Um, the question is whether those rights extend equally to everybody and whether you could have a regime in which, which is truly liberal if only some people enjoy those rights. And it seems to me Lincoln wants to insist that that proper free, there are two things. One, one I didn't emphasize sufficiently. Um, I want to say that in Lincoln's reformulation, true freedom comes out of the reestablishment of the primacy of the principle of equality. Not equality of result, but equality of the equal dignity and equal standing before, uh, before the law. And the other place where equality comes out is um, in the last sentence. Um, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, that is an assertion really of the supremacy of the democratic and not merely the liberal principle. Uh, not only that the people shall be governed and not only that it should be for their benefit, but it is government by the people. And that we here are the agents of the refounding. There's a kind of, you could say the founders were giants. Lincoln uh, dissembles the degree to which he's a giant and says, we together here will refound. I'm, I'm, I'm glossing this. It's not exactly what he says. But that the new founders are, in fact, the people who dedicate themselves to this refounding through the deeds of blood. Um, th this, is, this, is a re this is a baptism of the nation, a second birth. And it is not done by the giants, uh, great though they were. But it's really done by the people who've given their lives here in the soil and we who undertake to make sure they don't die in vain. That, it seems to me, is a correction of the problem of the beginning. It is what's really enabled the country to, to, to flourish morally. Uh, for present age, the question is um, whether the push for an equality of result isn't a certain perversion of the American principles of equality. And whether or not we now, those who are not content with equality before the law or equality of opportunity, but who insist on an equality of final result, an equality of income, an equality of all kinds of other things, whether they uh, are not now threatening certain of the liberties and rights to pursue happiness that um, it seems to me are fundamentally American. Uh, but uh, I don't think you could enlist Lincoln um, uh, in the name of redistribution of, 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 of income. You might be able to enlist them on certain safety nets uh, for people who are, not, who are badly off through no fault of their own. But that's, um, well, that's I a stretch. Would, I would, at the risk of stating or restating the obvious, uh, we are equal with, with respect to our rights. We are not equally beautiful, equally intelligent, equally anything else. It's equal with respect to our possession of these rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was the understanding at the beginning. Right. And Lincoln doesn't change that. And doesn't change that at all. And of course, that's the problem because it, it offers political problems because those who are unequally intelligent and greedy and so forth can cause political problems. Please. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the concept of political religion. 
um, and mm. how Lincoln may exemplify that. Uh, and you had mentioned when you introduced the concept in this uh, session about um, some rational aspects to it, but religion is really not about, you know, certainly an intellectual exercise or, or understanding things on that rational level. It's really a much more visceral, uh, emotional belief experience than... than I will, you want to do it I will begin that and Please. then I will call on you to finish it. Um, I would begin by going back to the Declaration of Independence and raising the question as to who is this God who's called nature's God and in the Declaration of Independence. And I do not think that that God is the Christian's God. Uh, we don't talk too much about that. And frequently our politicians insist that he was indeed the God that, that we recognize from the Bible. But this is the God who gives us a certain religious liberties that I do not think one can be, that can be found in the Bible. Now you go on. Well, I, I think uh, certainly the, uh, the God of the Bible is uh, much more interested in our duties and seems not at all interested in our rights. Um, but, uh, the word rights doesn't appear. Doesn't appear, okay. Um, but um, to come more directly to um, political religion, um, and particularly the question of the relation between reason, sentiment, passion, uh, in this thing. Um, the, the, those remarks in the Lyceum Address also puzzled me. Um, on the one hand, you call for reverence for the laws. Um, um, oh, Walter, you could probably quote this from memory about every lisping babe learning yeah. at his mother's knee um, to revere the laws and the Constitution. I've, I've ruined a very good passage, but um, and, and that this doesn't, and that, and that this is to be taught to lisping babes seems not to go through the cognitive uh, realm, right? They're supposed to feel a reverence and an attachment. On the other hand, at the end of the speech, he says, "Passion can no longer sustain us. The, the passion that attaches us to the memories of our dead ancestors that can't sustain us." Um, uh, rather, the materials for the new, the new um, bond has to be furnished by the quarry found uh, uh, of, of, of cold, calculating, um, dispassionate reason. I take it what he means is something like an attachment not to the deeds of the revolution, but to the principles, to the principles. On the other hand, the principles stated alone do not attach. The principles have to be clothed in a kind of poetic language, um, spoken of in exactly the way in which he speaks about them here, so that what you have is a magnificent combination of passionately rational speech. I mean, it's the speech is, I mean, that's partly what I'm hoping to do, it was hoping to do in, the, in going slowly through the speech. There's thought in this speech, I mean, conceived in liberty. I mean, what is he doing with the image of birth and then an image of rebirth? And if you stop over it, you can, you can sort of parse its manifest intellectual content, and yet it's done in such a poetic way, and it's done to stir the feelings and attach your feelings to this rational interpretation of these events and the meaning that he's given it. That's, I think, the coming together, uh, uh, Walter's sense of Lincoln as great poet. And the great poets are not simply gushers. The best of them are deep thinkers about the things that they're doing. It's not scientific reason. It's, it's, not, it's not disinterested reason, but it's reason to which the sentiments can be attached. And he was a master at making both the thought clear and to attaching the feelings to those thoughts so that they become permanently ours, not as abstract treatises, but really in these poetic renderings um, the best two of which, well, the, the end of the first inaugural and the two that you see on the two walls of the Lincoln Memorial, um, unparalleled in, in American history. 
You know, uh, something about the memorials always has struck me. Um, the kind of awe in which people stand there and look at that seated linking is something that doesn't, it doesn't take place at the Jefferson Memorial, in my experience. I want to make a radical statement following on what Liam has just said. It had to do with the possibility that Lincoln had intended himself have something to do with this new birth and so forth. To state it as radically as possible, we may owe a debt to John Wilkes Booth, who killed him. The consequence of that was expressed by a, a, a colleague of mine at, in the government department at Cornell years ago, who spoke of Lincoln as the martyred Christ of American democracy. Think of it, if you will. If he had not been assassinated, would we think of him as we do? That's a radical proposition, but I put it to you. When you think of his position in American politics prior to the end, and how ambiguous it was in the spring of 1864, and compare that to the nation's mourning, that train that goes from Washington through Pennsylvania to New York, all the way back to Springfield, stopping at every train stop so the American people can pay their reverence. To what extent do we owe a debt to John Wilkes Booth? I, I actually have follow-up questions. Just Please. something you mentioned. Please. Um, it, and it's regarding the speech and the concept of birth at the beginning and then the rebirth, but between birth and rebirth you have to have a death, do you not, in terms of the cycle? So what would the death be? Would, would it be the experience of the war? Um, well, was the question audible? Yeah. Um, well, if, if you think of baptism, literally, there isn't a death, literal death. Right. I mean, there's, but um, You're not supposed to speak about baptism. Who's me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do I believe in it? I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it done. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I think uh, um, there is a way in which I think Lincoln is saying that the flaw in the original founding. That, that the Civil War is, in a certain way, the death of the Union as originally founded, and it has to be reborn on a different foundation. Um, and in fact, I mean, this is to touch another example of um, the, the, uh, the civil religion and Lincoln's place in it. Um, before he was martyred, um, uh, he was already um, I think seeing a certain analogy between himself and the biblical foundings. If our, if he quotes Psalm 90, or he refers to Psalm 90 in the opening four score and seven years ago, our fathers. If you're still in the biblical vein, who are our fathers? Whether well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our fathers, right? Long ago they did something great. Um, but, uh, Who gave that nation a new birth of freedom? Moses. Who, in fact, got the slaves out of their enslavement. And that there is a certain sense, and, and, and in fact, the people of Israel have a second founding. There's a covenant made with Abraham, which is not abrogated, it's not forgotten. But it isn't the political covenant which is made at Sinai with these ex-slaves, Moses being the intermediary. Here, um, Lincoln is in a way reinterpreting the whole meaning of the country through its recent near-death experience, if you will, which is the Civil War, and redefining the relation between liberty and equality in this document so that we understand what it has to be going forward. 
so that it's, it's, not that the, it's, it's not that the old child is exactly dead. It's been saved, but given, been rededicated in a different way. And that's, it seems to me, not unlike what happens when a child is dedicated at a, at a baptism. Uh, it's no longer the natural birth. This is now a birth, a rebirth by choice and speech, but through blood and much blood. You know, let me add something to that. Um, and something about the, the Gettysburg Address. We should remember that the immediate audience of that address was the American people who overwhelmingly were a Bible-reading people. They knew that that reference, instead of saying 87, he said four score and seven. They knew that was someplace in the Bible, and probably most of them knew it was in the 90th Psalm. He goes on to say, our fathers brought forth, and I, I would swear a lot of Christians thought, our fathers who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Mm. And he goes right on and talk about the consecration of this particular spot of this war. Consecrate, made sacred. Again, we were a Christian people at that time, and he was speaking to them knowingly, I think. I think, uh, do we have time for one more? Sure, I think we're, we're, we're we, do we have time for one more question if there is one. Well, sure, please. Uh, Walter, you began with Shakespeare, and so I have to bring this up. Uh, I think I probably brought it up 40 years ago. But the great, the great letter to the Shakespearean actor where uh, no. Lincoln says, I read the tragedies over and over, and my favorite one is Macbeth. No. There's nothing like it. It's wonderful. And then it's, he's... It's wonderful. Yeah. And then he also says something about, well, you actors prefer the soliloquy in Hamlet to be or not to be. But I think the greatest soliloquy is Claudius. Oh, my offense is rank. Yeah. And cries out to heaven. Now, why do you think he preferred uh, Macbeth? And why do you think he preferred that, um, that soliloquy to all the others? Well, I would, I'm, just, I'm just guessing, Joe, but um, he fancied himself in well, he quotes Macbeth, you know. Duncan is in his grave and so forth and so on. He fancied himself as Duncan. And uh, that is all I can say about that. Oh, my goodness, I have, I have a more mischievous suggestion. Um, uh, in, and this goes back to the Lyceum Address, where Lincoln speaks Part of the reason he's so interested in political religion uh, for the populace as a whole is because they need something to attach their loyalty to the republic in order to protect them against the designs of those rare men who belong to the family of the lion the and the tribe, tribe of the, of the eagle, eagle <laughs> who um, uh, if um, would be just as uh, happy to enslave free men if they were free, as he would be to emancipate slaves. This is Abraham Lincoln, age 28. And I think Abraham Lincoln understands, this is partly one of a small piece of his inarticulable greatness. He understood himself to be one such person, a person of that kind of, that kind of ambition. But to be mindful of the danger of that ambition, and to be mindful of it um, and to put it under restraint at an early age makes him, I mean, Macbeth, Macbeth is a great man, but who didn't have Lincoln's self-consciousness and moral compass. Um, and, uh, and all of this humble um, talk, I mean, it wasn't yeah, that he was <laughs> dishonest, but he, um, like nobody uh, that you've ever seen, um, a man who could dissemble his superiority and make everybody around him think that he was really just Just a one of the boys. Just one of the boys. Telling dirty jokes. Astonishing. <laughs> Astonishing. And not insincere. I mean, the, it, it wasn't a put-on, and yet there was some fire in there 
enormous fire which he was aware of in himself, I think from boyhood, which is one of the reasons he didn't become a professor. <laughs> I think uh, we should thank you for your kind attention and interest. Um, read Lincoln and read Walter Burns' absolutely magnificent lecture which you have at your seat. It's glorious. Which was introduced by Leon Cass. <laughs>